dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back from the place where Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. As always, I am Bobby Munson, and I'm joined by the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes. Sir, how you doing? I'm doing great, Munson, and how all my wrestling people doing out there? We hope that you're all doing well, staying safe, staying healthy, and having a good old time, seeing some live wrestling, because Pop Smokes, we are back to a little bit of normalcy here in the world of professional wrestling and here in the world in general. So that means live shows, and it means we got one coming for you fans here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, on March the 26th of this, yeah, March the 26th of this year. What am I thinking? Pop Smokes, March 26th at the Cosmo Senior Center. Prairie Pro Wrestling presents the Seven Pounds of Gold as we continue to look for our first ever Prairie Pro Wrestling Champion. Four superstars left in this one, four great wrestlers left in this one. It could go any way. Uh, any early predictions, Pop of Smokes, or anyone you got your eyes on? Bob, my predictions in this tournament have all been wrong so far, so I'm going to quit while I'm still behind here. <laughs> I have no prediction uh, as to this, but the four wrestlers that are left are, are all excellent. They're all gunning for the gold, and uh, I'm looking forward to the final result, getting that belt strapped around somebody's waist. Yeah, so anyway, if you want to see how that tournament plays out, you're going to have to either catch it on YouTube on the replay once we get those matches uploaded for you, or join us live in Saskatoon. Get your tickets at the door, $15 at the door for adults and any children, 10 and under, only $5. So that's a $20 night out for you and the kid if you want to join us for live Prairie Pro Wrestling action here in Saskatoon. Pop of Smokes. We've got a lot going on here, especially at the Video Bros Network. A lot of big changes happen, a lot of crazy stuff going down. And we got a bit of announcement for anybody tuning in. Maybe you've heard it because we've said it on other shows, and that's uh, because this is all about other shows. We've been doing Ring Respect Radio or this version of Ring Respect Radio for a couple of years now. The channel's turning five, I believe, in May. I did, went and checked back on that. That was some of the HIW video uploads that I originally started with and starting with... Uh, Rob's Rock and Wrestling, as I decided to call it at first before I changed it to Ring Respect Radio because it just was a lot better of a name in many aspects. Uh, then we started doing the retro portion. I, I got uh, got a hold of you. You came in, built in a lot of the retro side, and we built Ring Respect Radio from that. And it's become what it is today. And because of that, I was able to jump on board with our good friends over at Love Wrestling. And just recently, Spencer Love reached out to me, and he wanted the video bros in some capacity over at Love Wrestling. <laughs> For a second there, I thought maybe Spencer had lost his marbles wanting to get the uh, foul mouth pot smoking Canadian duo of Pop Smokes and Bobby Munson over to Love Wrestling, but figure if he's tolerated me all this time already, he might as well get the both of us on board. So here's what we're doing for you, the fans. You've come to love our MLW reviews here on Ring Respect Radio, and we thank you for it. We thank everybody who's participated in watching those videos, following those videos and that we're talking to all you uh, people in mlw as well too that we've become good friends with uh we've had robert martyr bud heavy on the show and we hope to be able to do more interviews as we transition to the mlw reviews and talk over to love wrestling yes all our mlw content is going to move over to love wrestling where you'll be able to watch our new show major love wrestling with the video bros over at love wrestling and it's going to be a wonderful time papa smokes i'm so stoked for this it's going to be a big huge step up for us i'm also excited about this bob i've been following more of love wrestling since you've been uh, doing stuff with them and uh, a really uh, well-run channel it's it's going to put uh, ring respect radio on a bigger platform with more ears and eyeballs on uh, our reviews and our podcasts so I can't wait, and this way we'll be able to uh, interact with some more fans, with some more wrestlers, get some more uh, interviews with current wrestlers coming out to you, all kinds of fun, all kinds of new stuff. So I'm stoked this is going to be good. 
Yeah, we know that there's going to be a huge advantage because Spencer has had some good names from MLW as part of Love Wrestling in some capacity. Uh, he's had the likes of Alicia Tutu. You know, if you're going to be in the Edmonton area on March 25th, she's going to be a part of Love Pro Wrestling number two. Don't want to grow up that event going down in the Edmonton area. Uh, people can get their tickets for that show. Great big card that they've got going on there. And it's also going to be live on the Twitch channel. And that's where we'll be uh, with the new content that's coming out. So how it's going to work, we are going to do our best to watch MLW each week by Thursday, Friday-ish. Get that stuff all edited up. And hopefully by, say, like a Sunday or early the week, during the week, everything will be ready to go and up on Love Wrestling for our MLW reviews. This will include reviews, previewing upcoming shows, and hopefully special guests and interviews along the way as well, too. I'm thinking we got to, I'm thinking we might need to reach out to our good friend, Bud Heavy here. I think we could have Bud Heavy on the show. Might be a good time to start asking Akira Kwan to come on board. Like, you know, he's, he's got eyes on the video, bro. So I think that it's a good time. Uh, you know, there might be a few other surprises that we might be able to sneak in there as well too, Papa Smokes. I, I, I'm pumped. I think that it won't just be about us bringing in the enhancement talent for the interviews now. I think we're going to be able to fill our time with a lot of the talent from MLW. Uh, I think Alex Kane is also another name that Spencer has had the opportunity to talk to before too. So That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Uh, first of all, I'd like to have Bud on again. That's been one of the, my favorite of our chats that we've had on here. And uh, I'd like to have anyone on from there. As uh, you and I have interacted with a few of the uh, wrestlers on, on Twitter. So, um, yeah, it's all about getting some traction, building up uh, uh, relationships and, uh, and having some nice conversations online. Uh, looking forward to it. It is going to be wonderful. So you can check us out there. And in th having this happen, that means that we change in gears a little bit back to what Ring Respect Radio was not too long ago, talking about current topics in professional wrestling and then talking about the history that leads to those topics and also talking about the general history of professional wrestling, going way back to the territory days and kind of fill in those gaps that maybe some of today's fans don't really know and want to tune in and listen to, or maybe some people just want a retroactive look back on their life and what they used to love about professional wrestling. You're still going to be able to get that right here on the Video Bros Network with new episodes of Ring Respect Radio and also brought to you by our good friends right behind me. Boom, they're right there. I can't point worth a damn here, but Backbreaker Podcast, Backbreaker Media, Mike, we couldn't leave you, buddy. You've done too much here for the video bros, and we want to make sure that you get the R-rated, uncensored, never apologetic professional wrestling talk right here on the Video Bros Network and also on Backbreaker Media and the Canadian Wrestling Network. Damn, Papa Smokes, we're popping up all over the place these days. It's coming along good, and the, the more people we can get listening, the better, because uh, I, I believe in this project. We have a, a strong podcast out there. I've listened to some other ones. I think ours is uh, one of the better ones uh, kicking around for uh, independent Canadian uh, wrestling podcast. So let's get some more listeners. Let's get some more fans. I love the interaction and uh, I love doing these chats with you. I really do too. And uh, speaking of listeners, speaking of fans, if you're tuning in for the very first time and have never done so before, or if you maybe just have forgotten to the last few times that we've asked you to, there's a subscribe button down below on this channel. You can subscribe to the Video Bros Network. Find out anytime we release new content. I think there's a little bell beside it. That's a notification bell. Damn it. Click the bell too. And then you'll get those neat little pop-ups every time you fire up your phone or your computer saying that the Video Bros have new content for you. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Give us everything you can because we want to be able to ramp up what we do here on the Video Bros Network and bring you all the best in professional wrestling content right here on Ring Respect Radio. And man, Papa Smokes, we haven't done one of these for a while, and it, it it's not a good one to have to do, but it's also something we, we like to do, and that's pay homage to somebody who's recently passed from us. And this one, uh, this one's pretty fresh. Uh, so it was many, many years ago that we said hello to the bad guy. And unfortunately, on Sunday, we said goodbye to the bad guy for the very last time. Yes, Scott Hall passing away after three simultaneous heart attacks that happened from a complication of a blood clot, I believe, during a hip surgery that he had recently. Uh, his family took him off the life support. I believe it was Monday, actually, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that he was taken off life support Sunday that he went into the hospital. And unfortunately, the world lost possibly one of the best professional wrestlers in terms of his ability inside the ring his charisma, everything. The guy was the full package and we're going to unfold his career here today, but uh, 
you know, just thinking about Scott Hall, man, uh, this, this one hit uh, pretty hard and just one that I did, you know, maybe 10 years ago expected a little bit more than I expected today. Yeah. And I mean, uh, we both saw this, a lot of the reaction to Hall's death online and uh, yeah, this one hits the wrestling world hard because he's a, he's a guy that's passed young at the age of 63 so a lot of us have seen his work. This isn't like an old guy that was active in the 60s and 70s and 80s. This is a guy that was still wrestling in the 90s and, and, and early 2000s at least or making appearances. So everybody remembers Scott and everybody remembers the huge uh, run he had as Razor Ramon and, and uh, in the NWO, in the, in the WCW era. I mean... He was one of the most famous wrestlers on the planet during the 90s, without question. So it hits everybody hard because everybody has their own particular memories of him and uh, and us old timers and a lot of the young people as well. So a uh, tough one for the wrestling community. We can really connect across the board with this one. And we're going to, you know, we don't want to sit here and don just on the man's death and we're not going to harp upon his uh his, his troubles i mean we it, it's well documented he had troubles with uh substance abuse and stuff like that and it's something that is a real struggle for a lot of people out there and hopefully that anybody who is struggling with those things gets the help that they need and i don't want to go on too long talking about that part of scott hall's life i'd rather talk about a little bit of his life and moving into the great career that he had and paying homage to the to the man behind the character that we all grew up and grew to love uh, we will touch on the one thing about his personal life, though. I mean, it would be without saying that uh, he did have some problems when it came to spending time in prison uh, back in 83 when he was, uh, I mean, it was it was a self-defense move that uh, he had had to wrestle a gun away from a guy at a nightclub, but he ended up shooting the guy in the process uh, and ended up uh, charged with second degree murder. Uh, this is something that maybe a lot of people aren't aware of. Maybe they are. I'm not sure. But again, it's it was in self-defense, but we can't take away from the fact that, you know, Scott Hall did do a little bit of hard time for, you know, an incident back in the early 80s before his wrestling career kind of got the chance to take off. Yeah. And like uh, we've I've often used this phrase uh, on this podcast and, and elsewhere, too, that most of the best professional wrestlers come from min Minnesota. And Scott Hall was one of those. And he was also one of those guys that started as a bouncer in a bar, just like the Road Warriors, just like Demolition, just like a bunch of guys. They were all uh, bouncers at that crazy bar, Grandma B's in Minneapolis. And uh, Scott Hall being one of those. And uh, yeah, this incident, there's not a lot said about it. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I wasn't there. I don't know what actually happened, but uh yeah, it resulted in a man's death, and, and that's always a serious thing, but uh, he never went down for what he could have. Um, he wasn't uh, indicted for murder or anything. Or he didn't never got convicted of murder. I think he might have done time for manslaughter, something, like, something to that effect, or uh, uh, self-defense causing death or something like that. But uh, another, uh, an early obstacle in his life that he had to get over and... Uh, this is a young guy working, partying, doing some uh, obviously hard at work bodybuilding at that time too. Uh, and uh, that couldn't have been easy for him, uh, including the personal feelings of having contributed to the uh, death of another person, you know, like that. I'm sure that weighed on his spirit heavily, but uh, this was all before he even became a wrestler. So even early on, he was overcoming obstacles uh, to uh to make his career the way he wanted it and you could often wonder if that led to a lot of the uh you know the eventual drinking and stuff like that and abuse that he had himself i mean that that would obviously <clears throat> play heavily on a person's mind and be uh, something you could never live down and i'm sure he never never had the opportunity i mean on top of that i'm sure there's a lot of enough hardships in the wrestling industry as we've seen to cause a person to go down that path as it is so a tough life that scott hall had but again Let's not dwell on it. Let's go to talking about the man the, that he became, the impact he had on this business as well, too. I, that, that's what I want to focus on. Uh, he was a well-traveled man. I mean, obviously, he grew up a military kid, uh, traveling all around the world and uh, even attending 
school in various parts of uh, around the world as well too. Uh, but it was 1984 that he finally came to the NWA Florida territory, uh, where he would, you know, inevitably feud with the uh, legendary Dusty Rhodes. But in the meantime, he was actually trained with an interesting guy. He trained with Dan Spivey, who uh, many listeners, if they could go back to the 1990s, might remember a character named Waylon Mercy in the WWF, but a very similar uh, almost persona, almost predating the Bray Wyatt uh, swamp leader cult uh, guy, the guy character that uh, Bray came into the WWE with. Uh, so he trained with Dan Spivey and actually created a tag team with him shortly after uh, when he would wrestle under the name of, uh, I believe, uh, he wrestled as Starship and the team was called Starship Eagle. Uh, Pop Smokes, I know you're itching to talk more about this. I know you'd be more familiar with the 1984 Florida Territory. So just uh, give us a little rundown. Well, yeah, this would have been a great place for any wrestler to get their feet wet because uh, Florida in the uh, 70s and 80s was a huge hotbed for pro wrestling. Um, some of those areas, including uh, Tampa and Fort Lauderdale, were were promoted by Eddie Graham, one of the true masters of, of booking and promoting professional wrestling. Um, Graham died before his time, but if... Uh, Hall had soaked up anything from Eddie Graham, he would have a, his head screwed on straight about the way the business is run, the way booking is done, the way uh, kayfabe is kept, the way characters, uh, uh, but the way you can help develop your own character, but still keep it logical in terms of the uh, TV appearances and uh, live match appearances. This would be a great place to start. And there would also be a lot of other quality talent working there at that time. Uh, Florida in the 80s had more people, more good wrestlers that wanted to work there than they could really fit in. So uh, I imagine that he stood out because of his uh, intense uh, physical gifts. Uh, Hall had to be six, six, six foot seven, maybe. And then, like I say, his bodybuilding had been coming along for a long time. So good looking guy, very tall, a lot of muscle packed on that body. You remember what he looked like in the old ones, too. He had the kind of wavy, longer hair and the uh, Magnum-style mustache. So, of course, uh, a lot of the ladies liked him, and uh, they started him out as a baby face. He had his period where he was green, too, but from that, uh, from those first months and years in, in Florida, he uh, ended up going back to Minneapolis and working with the AWA with uh, Vern Gagne. And this is where he really started to get uh, the hang of the business. This is where I first started watching him too, as he was just known simply as Big Scott Hall. And um, he was used as a baby face, uh, job guy, more or less. Uh, job guy who got some spots in, in his matches, but still always ate the one, two, three kind of thing. But you could see even in those, uh, in the mid eighties there that this guy has something, he's going to be something. He has such physical gifts and he's, he's so, uh, so uh, captivating in his look that you, you had to believe that this guy was going to be something. Eventually he just needed the chance, the experience and, and the character to work with. Yeah. And I've, I've got written down here too, that during that time working with Vern Gagne, he actually went over to Japan between 1987 and 1990 to work for New Japan Pro Wrestling in some matches as well too. And that uh, he also had matches against Stan Hansen and Rick Martel for the AWA World Heavyweight Championship. Do you recall these matches and uh, what were those like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he had big success first as a tag team. That was his first, um, foray into being uh uh you know towards the middle of the card to getting some wins on his uh resume he started teaming with kurt hennig who we all know who is still a baby face at that time still a very skilled wrestler but uh uh kind of just floundering a little bit with his character he could just was kind of had the uh character that it was just him his real name his straight up appearance and all that, not, not really uh, jazzing it up all that much, uh, considering uh, how much some people jazz up their characters in professional wrestling. Both of them were pretty much straight up baby faces. So uh, they won the tag team titles and uh, had a nice program against a few teams, including uh, 
the road warriors and the long riders and a, and a few and the sheiks and a few other teams up in awa now this territory by the mid to later 80s wasn't doing so great now they didn't have the uh the talent that they used to but uh, this was one of their big teams was hall and, and hennig and then when uh hennig decided to go singles he wanted to, they were going to promote him to the top of the card he uh of course has the famous uh match where he beats nick bockwinkle for the awa title so obviously the tag team isn't going to be anymore but then uh, they put scott hall on his own give him some singles runs and yeah he had a couple title matches including as you say martel and uh stan hansen towards the end of the awa and you could see he was kind of starting to find his place he was starting to understand the business and his place in it and then um we saw what happened after that but i think the the awa was a good learning ground for him as well as the florida territories and uh I think he he developed his chops during these times and and really not only uh, people just think it's ring work or or mic work sometimes, but I I think under these veterans, Hall started to understand the way that wrestling works as a business in the way that um, developing a a branded character and uh, and keeping everything logical and keeping everything uh, kayfabe it worked good while it while it was a thing before the internet and uh i think this is where he got his confidence to be a single star yeah i believe so too uh i got a couple things that we'll go over before we start <clears throat> getting into the side of razor ramon uh so first of all uh during this time uh, that we're talking about now, he also had tryouts in 87 and 1990 with the WWF at the time, uh, the latter of which the 1990 appearance actually was a taping for WWF's wrestling challenge. Now, I wanted to run this by you because I know you've told me the story and I think that it might be interesting to the fans. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, there was two versions of the Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon WWF television. There was WWF's Wrestling Challenge, and then there was WWF Superstars. And I believe that it was because it ran in different markets, if I'm not mistaken, from the story that you had mentioned. Yeah, I think what happened was uh, WWE had a harder time getting into Canada because uh, I, I don't understand all the complete rules about the cable systems and such, but Canada wouldn't didn't want the WWE show, unless it was a Canadian version of that show. If you remember the old WWF superstars on Saturday morning, they always had the the WWF president was Jack Tunney. You remember that guy? Yes, of course I do. Older man. He was the guy, the authority figure that laid down the law and stuff. Well, behind the scenes, what Jack Tunney really was, just the WWF's main promoter for Toronto. Okay. So, in order to crack the Canadian market the way they wanted to on cable TV, they had to make a Canadian version of the show. The first one I watched was called Maple Leaf Wrestling. And all the tapings were in Toronto and they always featured Jack Tunney as the, as the uh, authority figure on them. So we didn't get the American version of that show. They had to tape a different version and they could use a lot of the same uh, material that they already had. But it had to be presented as a Canadian product. So um, that's why the shows that we saw when we were kids are different than the ones that the American kids and other international kids were watching because uh, they had to have a Canadian feed for their WWF show. And I actually remember, like, and this is why it confused me as a kid, because, again, we're talking about a time where the Internet was non-existent, like having a computer in your home wasn't yeah. exactly a big thing at this point either, unless you had a lot of money. Um, I remember having this board game, and it was WWF's Wrestling Challenge, and I kept thinking to myself, like, am I missing something here? Where do I find Wrestling Challenge on my television set? I had WWF superstars on the TV, but I could not ever find Wrestling Challenge, and, of course, trying to hunt it down back then was trying to find a needle in the haystack and could never figure out why. And that's why it's great these many years later to get this kind of, you know, reassurance as to why that existed back then kind of thing. And I just, I find it to be a very interesting story. And that's why I wanted to kind of elaborate on that. Uh, but yes, yeah, Scott Hall in a uh, losing effort actually had a tryout in 1990 that was pre-taped for an episode of WWF's Wrestling Challenge. Yeah. 
Well, I can believe that Vince was completely into Hall's look at that time. I mean, I'm sure he wanted him. He, you know what Vince's fetish is, is huge muscular bodybuilder guys. Doesn't, uh, you know, usually he doesn't care if they can work or if they can talk or any of that shit. He'll deal with it later. He wants big, muscular, imposing, gigantic guys. Yeah. So there had to be something at that time. Maybe uh, Hall's work just really wasn't there yet, or maybe there wasn't the character yet or something like that. But um, I'm sure Vince years later was quite happy to get him. But first Hall had gone to WCW as a single, yeah. right? You can lead this month. And- yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, 1989 is when he was brought in actually by none other than Jim Ross himself brought him into the, at the time, the NWA's, WCW because the NWA still was the parent company overseeing world championship wrestling at the time uh so yeah Jim Ross brought him into the company again he acted as a jobber there for the most part uh, often jobbing out to the likes of the great Muda uh Mike Rotunda Sid Vicious Ron Simmons and Butch Reed again not a bad list to have to take losses to by any means there's some uh great amazing talent on that list and uh probably a lot that Scott learned in that short period of time working with WCW in 1989 Absolutely. And uh, uh, no shame in losing to any of those guys that you mentioned. But another thing about his time in NWA WCW was that he was known as the Diamond Stud there. Actually, and, that, that one comes up pretty soon here. <laughs> so he, he actually oh, was made he a, not? He made a he return. wasn't at he, the very beginning? No, actually, okay. no. He, I uh, believe... Might have still been going as Magnum Scott Hall or something like that upon the initial okay. start, or might have been, as you said, Big Scott Hall when he came in yeah. in 1989. Briefly left the company in 1990 to 91 to go to uh, participate in the Catch Wrestling Association tournaments. And so, so he actually did spend oh. some time in the, the now defunct uh, CWA that I didn't know even existed until I read up on Scott Hall. So this actually caught my interest. I was like, Catch Wrestling Association now. I kind of want to go find out more about the CWA after, after we're through with this. But th- there was a short period there. Don't have much to add to that. But it was in 1991 that he made that return after that to the WCW, where he was there for another year. And that's where the name was changed to the Diamond Stud. DDP is his manager. And I'm going to hand the reins back to you, Pops, folks. Sure, sure. And uh, I-, I think this is a very significant time for Hall because... As we've said here, he would have been learning from a lot of veterans all along here. Uh, probably had a, a, a learned a nice chunk of stuff in CWA as well. But when he got to WCW the second time and became the Diamond Stud, this is where now you see that he's taking control of his persona and he's trying something different. He, the the straight up uh, beefcake babyface guy isn't really catching fire like he hoped so he's he's got a heel character now and this guy's uh you know he's got the five o'clock shadow and the shades and the the greasy hair and and vests and all that stuff not so far removed from what it would become as razor ramon but i like this the diamond stud because that's the genesis of the idea he he got the idea he enacted it but it wasn't perfect yet. He had to still work on it and polish it, uh, polish it up nicely. And uh, yeah, this, this to me is where the modern Scott Hall first, first begins. It really was. And uh, from there, it actually turned into a bit of a faction that became known as the diamond mine. Funny enough that they have the diamond mine now in NXT involving uh involving a few members of the NXT 2.0 roster. Uh, So the Diamond Mine, yeah, initially was a WCW faction, including the Diamond Stud, Scott Hall himself, and manager Diamond Dallas Page. And for good or for worse, the Diamond Stud was one of the members of the uh, not-so-ever-popular Chamber of Horrors match from Halloween Havoc 1991. Cheap plug, Papa Smokes and I talk about that on our Halloween Havoc special from Ring Respect Radio. Hopefully, if I think about it, I'll put a link right up there somewhere so you guys can go back and check that out as well, too. But that would have been kind of like the the pinnacle of his run in WCW. After that, it was going to be on to the WWF, which is where I got introduced to him for the very first time that I recall from my childhood uh, he went into the WWF and he was told to pitch a character and again he went and he went in with that similar 
diamond stud type thing, but he changed it a little bit from what I read and from people taking stuff from interviews. He said that he originally pitched the idea to Vince as a bit of a joke saying about uh, the character of Tony Mont. uh, sorry, to, yeah, something over my words or Tony Mont at Montana from Scarface. Uh, he wanted to kind of present his character, this guy driving around in Cadillacs and stuff like that with the leopard skin and talking in the accent that he did and just yeah, the other the machismo and everything and just the anger that he would bring to the table and stuff like that. And he apparently pitched this as a bit of a joke to Vince, and Vince was on board with it. He loved the idea, and it turns out later. Vince thought he made the whole thing up from scratch because he had never yeah. seen or heard of Scarface. And yeah. so he was very unaware of Tony Montana or the actions of him. So this was brand new to Vince at the time. Yeah, I'll bet that sounded fresh too. And isn't that a weird thing that <laughs> that of all people that haven't seen Scarface, Vince McMahon hasn't seen it? I mean, <laughs> he's got some of the same business practices as Tony Montana. So I'm, I'm really surprised that he hasn't seen that. But yeah, it must have sounded completely fresh. I, I know uh, I've read some of that stuff too. And Hall was just dumbfounded that uh, that anyone didn't know that movie in this day and age. But at any rate, uh, his pitch was was gold, and and we got one of the better characters from modern WWE out of it. We did, yeah. And again, uh, to elaborate on the name, is that uh, Vince had pitched the name Razor. That was where that portion of it comes from. And then the Ramon part came from him reaching out to Tito Santana and asking him for a good Spanish type name that he could use for this character that definitely had that kind of that R, that R that rolls off the tongue so that you could get a razor, a Ramon. So that was actually pitched by Tito Santana to him to use the Ramon part of his name. So I found that uh, was quite an interesting tidbit as I'm going through this thing too. And then that's when the debut happens. Razor Ramon comes on and he hits the scene hard. As a fan of WWF in the early 90s, Papa Smokes, I see this guy come in and it's like, who the hell is this guy? He's got my attention. The look's got my attention. The vignettes got my attention. Okay, but I've seen a million vignettes shown and guys come in and they're a flash in the pan. They're gone after Vince learns that it's not the play toy he was looking for. This guy comes in and not only does he start making an impact, but his first major feud and early on, was against Macho Man Randy Savage, to which he defeated in said feud, going over the Macho Man. And as a kid, this one really caught my attention because like, holy shit, this guy, this guy's business. Because nobody comes in and just walks over the Macho Man, the you know former WWF champion, uh, the legend, living legend himself at the time. You didn't just walk in and beat the Macho Man. I mean, not at this point in time, not at any point in time. And this guy did it. And he did it convincingly. He did it amazingly the match itself was actually really really well done i still remember it to this day uh love going back uh, you know razor's got quite a few big matches and i will talk about a couple more but uh do, do you recall this time and age did you ever see the razor Ramon macho man randy savage matchup from when he started out yeah there? yeah of course i was uh, still watching that at that time and uh man it's even as surprising as it was for us as kids to see the macho man go down to the sort of newer guy it's even more mind-boggling to me now to think of the booking meetings and and those guys setting up that match savage didn't like to lose man the savage did not like to do the job ever to anybody especially not a, a new guy to the federation like that and I bet you there were some uh, words spoken in that, and I, I bet you that might have even been a scary match for uh, for Scott to go in because uh, Randy didn't like that. Randy uh, was was pretty stiff to the guys he didn't like, like extremely stiff. So that might have been a tough one. I'll have to go back and watch that again. But the other thing you noticed when Razor Ramon first started in the WWE. Uh, just as an aside, by the way, I didn't recognize him. Like I had been watching this guy on TV for years and I didn't recognize him at first. Even when I had seen a little bit of the diamond stud, I should have recognized him, but I didn't. It was so mind boggling to me when, uh, when I did realize that was Scott Hall, but at any rate, he had changed so much, not only his uh, physical appearance, but the way he worked in the ring, I, I mean, I had been used to seeing him as a baby face doing arm drags and drop kicks and high spots and all that stuff. And here he comes into WWE with a, a new heel working style, a nice, slow, 
deliberate style. He had those, uh, he was so tall and had those long arms. He did those slashing forearm smashes and those chops and everything like looked so cool. Um, also his finishing sequence too, where he would set the guy on the top rope and do that side suplex off the second rope. And then the, uh, the razor's edge is the finisher. Now that's a commonplace move. Everybody's bitten that move off, off of him or wherever he got it in the first place too. But uh, uh, again, that was a brand new move for everybody watching at that time, myself included. And absolutely devastating. It looks so good. It's, it's the kind of finisher that you just can't imagine anyone ever kicking out of. Just fantastic. I, I, was, I was loving it immediately. And what a splash he made with the fans in WWF. Here's the one thing I really love about the Razor's Edge. It's, you're right. It was extremely impactful when it came out. It's still to this day, even when I see guys do this move, it's still impactful. It looks fantastic. It is one of those moves that looks great, but to me, feels like one of the safer moves in the ring because there is a lot of control in that move. It seems like a guy can be guided down perfectly into the proper back bump and everything like that, positioned well for it, nothing fancy that they have to do about it. It's such a great looking move and an impactful move that doesn't require ever putting your putting you or your opponent at an extreme risk is my best way of summing it up. Yeah, there, there's a there's two ways you can do it too. There's a safe way and then there's a much more dangerous way. Razor would kind of almost go down to his knees and and throw the guy down quite in a controlled manner or whatever, but. We've seen uh, in past years now some guys such as Hernandez from TNA that would do the border toss would get you up there and hurl you across the ring. Yeah. And it was the, the victim or the opponent's uh, job to make sure they take that bump somewhere flat on their back a little bit or else you're going to land on your head and the back of your neck and stuff like that. I mean, so I think it's in the way that you do it. I'm sure WWF at that time was encouraging him to do it um, in a slightly safer manner, but uh, that, that can be a pretty wild one too. Even in uh, PPW, we've seen that move uh, almost yeah. go wrong a couple of times too. Well, I, we, we've seen it also make a big impact. I was just thinking about that time we saw she Parsh Bass putting uh, Cannonball Kelly up over his head and launching him three quarters of the way across the PPW ring. Yeah. Again, if you haven't seen that, go check out all our uh, work at Perry Pro Wrestling so you can catch up on that. But damn it, man, that move was impactful. And again, Shiki does a beautiful version of the Razor's Edge of yes. his own and stuff like that. And hey, Shiki, if you're listening, uh, I think it's uh, long overdue that you come join the video bros on an episode of Ring Respect Radio. Yeah. We can talk all about your finisher there. Uh, so yeah, it'd be nice to get Sheik on the show. Maybe we need to make this his official call out and uh, we'll reach out to you, Sheik. We'll have our people call your people. Uh, so moving on from there, uh, we talked about Randy Savage, but Razor would get a really massive opportunity in the form of replacing uh, somebody that not everybody is a big fan of. And I know that uh, we aren't particularly big on this guy's in-ring work, especially looking back on it. Uh, the Ultimate Warrior, who inevitably was fired from the WWF was set to go against Brett the Hitman Hart at the Royal Rumble for the WWF Championship. I don't even know if that's a match that Brett could have saved. I mean, if anyone could, Brett might have been able to, but Jesus, I just, I think it back, I'm like, nope. The, I'm glad that didn't happen but instead we got Razor Ramon versus Bret Hart in what was actually a really strong really well done matchup at the Royal Rumble I uh, think it back one of the better one-on-one -on -one championship matches that's ever been done at the Royal Rumble in my personal opinion because uh, again Hitman can roll with anybody and Razor I mean Scott Hall he had the total package so you got two strong great workers in there that can really put on a show and they put on a fantastic show to which at the end this is really where the birth of cheering for a bad guy especially in the early 1990s i mean this is when he would start to say the phrase it's time to root for the bad guy and like this thing would connect and i don't know if it was ever intended for it to connect but we started to take a bit of a turn at that time ourselves and start thinking hmm, i don't mind cheering for this guy i mean yeah he slaps people around he throws things off of tables he has a temper tantrum but he kicks some serious ass in that ring and he puts on quite the show people were cheering for him by the end of this match with Bret Hart, Bret was the victor, but I don't know if Bret was really the winner in the end because Skull Hall came out of this looking like a million bucks. 
Yeah, yeah, that's completely true. And not only that Royal Rumble match of theirs together, I saw this match live at a WWF show in Winnipeg in the early 90s sometime. And uh, it was it was great. It was really, really great match. And uh, I remember the finish like it was yesterday. Uh, Hall gave Hart the razor's edge and then in his arrogance didn't pin him but set him up to do it again got him up and Hart turned it into the small package one two three and Razor's furious with that and uh, what a cool ending um, very excellent match and just two guys that just beg to be in the ring together you you want to see this match because both guys are hitting their stride uh, in ring work and mic microphone work and uh, what what a good time what a great time it was for wrestling and this was uh, the years just leading up to when uh, you know the whole plot would be lost kind of with the attitude era coming up right away Scott Hall having a big part of that too but he was also part of the previous little generation there where the the matches were there was a little bit more of a, a concentration on having good uh, ring work and good matches uh, rather than what it became in, in the sort of uh, further into the nineties. Yeah. And uh, he would have got, he would have some other great moments in the WWF before we even start talking about the WCW times as well, too, including putting over who uh, eventually would become a good buddy of his Sean Waltman as the one, two, three kid on an episode of Monday night raw. This was shocking as hell when it happened, especially yeah. looking at the one, two, three kid as a kid, I'm like, this, this, this guy doesn't seem like a wrestler to me. I mean, nowadays he'd probably be three times the size of half the guys that step into the squared circle. But yeah. when Sean Waltman originally stepped in the ring, I was so used to the large big talent in WWF that this guy was a shocking surprise in many ways. And for him to have the roll up victory over a guy, the caliber of razor really kind of put him on the map in a big way. It gave him a rub that I don't know that he necessarily would have got at that time in the nineties. Had he not had somebody like Scott Hall, so willing to work with him. Yeah. I, and Waltman had been the lightning kid before that. And then they brought him in as the one, two, three kid for, excuse me for that particular angle. But, it's exactly as you say, I, if he had not become personal friends with Scott Hall and Shawn Michaels, I, he would have, you know, what? who knows what would have happened. He might have never got that spot. He might have never got that chance to, to get out of the uh, preliminary wrestler's position and, and into a, a made guy in the WWF. So it, it's all about who you know sometimes and, and, as we'll see coming up in the WWF here, uh, Scott Hall started hanging around with, you know, I, I sound like somebody's dad or something, but uh, started hanging around with the wrong crowd. I don't know how else to put it exactly, but uh, whatever pre uh, pre prediction he had for uh, drugs and alcohol and partying before that, once he started hanging around with Michael's uh Hunter Hearst, Helmsley, and uh, and Big Kevin Nash, then that's that's when the kind of the writing started to be on the wall. He got huge, uh, he got much more popular as a character, but uh, I think that it was almost the beginning of the end of his tenure in wrestling because uh, he got on a road that he couldn't get off of. That's true. Uh, you know, WrestleMania 9, he had taken on uh, one of my personal favorites, Bob Backlund as well, too, in what match that pretty much nobody necessarily remembers, but I had to bring it up because Bob Backlund is fantastic and everyone should go check out his body of work, too. And then uh, before we start talking about one of the most legendary pieces of his WWF tenure, uh, I would be uh, amiss if I didn't say that he was really kind of one of the ones that first led the way for the character of gold dust uh, also dustin Rhodes, uh to many people especially watching the uh aew nowadays uh who came in with this very bizarre character that they played up as this this hollywood almost like male starlet that came out and he had the gold glitter coming from the sky but he psychologically would get to guys and i remember him having the heart drawn onto his chest and it said razor in the middle of it and he really 
was trying to drive home that whole get under Razor's skin with the idea that he might be, you know, a little bit attracted to old Razor there kind of thing. And this this was impactful as in the time and stuff like that. It, nowadays, I don't think that this same thing would have gotten over the way it did in the nineties, like it did, but no. uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was what it was. And I mean, really, again, showed that Scott Hall was willing to really do that kind of work. He was willing to go the extra mile to help new characters get over to help uh, new people get over as well too. And, you know, again, I mean, that might stem from the fact that, you know, he had feuds with Dusty Rhodes in the past. So he would have been really good friends with Dusty and here Dustin comes along. So opportunity is to work with his son and everything like that. I think that played into it as well too. And I, you know, a wonderful job by both guys, both great talents. But what we really want to talk about when it comes to the WWF is the Intercontinental title run. Scott Hall, one of the most legendary Intercontinental champions in the history of the WWF. Uh, a fantastic run that he had there, which accumulated in what would be one of the probably I think is rated number five on the list of top 25 matches in WrestleMania history. I'm still, uh, yeah, that makes sense. It'd probably be about a number five, probably the best, if not one of the only really true good ladder matches in WWF kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Ladder matches get way overbooked, way overdone kind of thing yeah. and they don't quite have the impact but this hadn't been done in the wwf at the time it happened at a wrestlemania it happened with two guys who were willing to go out there and put it on the line put on a hell of a show and a hell of a show they put on this one is a classic i did go back and watch this one and still to this date i had no problem watching this match from start to finish it is a fantastic match and it's talked about for many reasons for sure and these two guys were becoming good friends and we all know how friends in the business can have great matches together. A lot of people say, uh, uh, like, I'm not a huge fan of ladder matches either. You know, one once in a while is a good idea. There, there are some companies that have them on every show and such. But uh, this, this was the first real big one where the guys actually made the ladder a character in the match like the latter was like another wrestler in the match and that that was the whole key to it i think was was not just using it as a prop but using it as as a uh, part of their offense like it's like another arm or another leg kind of and they they use the ladder so creatively and with uh, the various climbing spots and picking it up and using it and throwing it and and anchoring it in the ropes and throwing a guy into it like a, they they really got creative with with the ladder as as I, as I like to say kind of like another character in the match and I think that's what carried well there was two of them wasn't there uh, two famous ladder matches with the same guys Ramon versus Michaels and uh, I mean they just set the world on fire with those matches no one had ever seen anything quite like that before and then I also think that's what took off for ladder matches in general too is that everybody wanted to be a part of of the creativity that they had made in in the wrestlemania ladder match yeah and uh, speaking of that second match a lot of people forget about it because it happened SummerSlam of that same year and again going to the well twice in a row like that people tend to forget about the second time around as opposed to the first time which made that instant impact with the fans and everything like that um, but not to take away from the SummerSlam match again it was two big guys big show you know putting on a great match it's just that again once you had seen it once it does take a little bit of the steam out of it the second time around um, so again it that's why I think a lot of people probably tuning in probably forget about the summer slime encounter the second time. And again, it was still for the intercontinental title. Uh, but this uh, in about 1996, I believe it was when Scott Hall came to the end of his WWF run. Uh, infamously, he would do something that had not been necessarily done, especially at a uh, big show, especially in Madison square garden where him, Kevin Nash, Triple H and Shawn Michaels came out to the ring, the moment known as the click, given the too sweet symbol right in the middle of the ring when you've got two baby faces and two heel guys, two of which were leaving the company, two of which were sticking around, uh, one of which really took the punishment for it, and one of which they couldn't because he was the champ at the time, if you listen to certain stories anyway from other people that were there at the time. Uh, so that was that him leaving the WWF was that moment that Madison Square Garden moment. And I remember 
hearing all about this kind of thing. This this was one of those news traveled pretty fast considering professional wrestling at the time to find out that this was going down. We didn't have access to the internet, so this wasn't like an instant thing on people's phones coming in from the actual live event. But this news got through to many wrestling fans quite quickly on this one. And for good reason, too, because uh, most of the wrestling veterans and uh, and uh, administrators and uh, wrestlers that had been uh, active for a long time were were aghast at this. I mean, that that's absolutely the worst thing you can do in the era of kayfabe which was kind of dissolving a little bit at this time. I mean, the, the, there was starting to be uh, an internet and, and message boards on the internet where now smart fans from across the country and across the world could start to speak to each other about different matches in their area. And then they could compare notes and say, okay, well, they're booking it this way. They're booking it that way. That's one of the ways that, that kayfabe started to crumble for sure was uh, people chatting about it on the internet. But when this happened, I mean, my God, now you got the top stars in the top company in the world just throwing kayfabe out the door and showing the fans that there there is no division between the heels and the faces and that they're all friends but behind the scenes. There were probably fans in that building that didn't know the two were leaving, that Hall and Nash were leaving the company, all that kind of stuff. It just, it opened up the bag. It, it, it pulled the sheet back so that everything could be seen. And uh, there's a lot of people that will never forgive those guys for what they did. After myself being one of them back then, at least now, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, it, it's, it's only the first uh, egregious uh move against kayfabe at this time but uh it's one of the more blatant ones and uh yeah i'm just left thinking like what were you guys thinking about this like they really thought they were bigger than the business and i know that hunter hurst uh, was saying like yeah it'll be michaels and i in wwe and the other guys in in wcw in the big company we're going to control the entire business so we don't care what anybody else thinks and it was kind of a short-sighted way to look at it, but uh, the little brats uh, did it anyway. And uh, mm -hmm. and as we see, just really, it was only Helmsley that got punished for it. He had to go around and apologize to everyone. And everyone in the back, as far as I've ever heard, tore a strip off him and said, what the fuck do you think you were doing, you asshole? You're, you're killing the business for all of us. And uh, I don't think he cared, man. Like, I... I I'm sure he took his punishment uh, as he did, but uh, he was already getting uh, firmly into the company. And I, he, he had said back then too, there's many people that heard him, heard Helmsley say it too. I'm going to run this business and I'm going to run this company someday. I, I promise you, I will by hook or by crook. I will. And we all see once again, with hindsight, what happened, he married the boss's daughter so that he could never get fired. And, uh, yeah, some greasy stuff going on at that time, and, and Hall was part of that. But um, like I say, I, I don't think any of that would have been his idea. I just think he got caught up in some uh, some guys that were that were doing the wrong thing and being bad and uh, and doing too much drugs and thinking they were the the be all end all of a company where yeah you might be that for a little bit but uh in the wrestling business you you can also be gone tomorrow too so um yeah that's that's the way it happened and uh i mean hall and nash left the wwe or wwf at that time with with uh, the the stain of disrespect on them and and it didn't seem to matter to their popularity or anything but uh in the grand scheme of things uh a lot of people never respected them in the business after that. Yeah, and afterwards, Razor Ramon would make a <clears throat> great return as the fake Razor shortly after that. In WWE. No, we won't even start on that one. Uh, I, but I, I can't even blame Vince for doing that. The point he was making is the same thing that, well, actually, you guys think you're the top of the business. I can get other guys to play your character. And of course, it didn't really come across the same, but he made his point and the, one of the few times I kind of agreed with one of Vince's bizarre moves like that, 
and uh, he wasn't going to be held hostage by his own wrestlers. Yeah. So, and then uh, shortly after, he got the debut of the uh, Hawk Hogan, I believe it was the Huckster. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, enough of that. So, uh, the Scott Hall leaves WWF to head over to WCW with Kevin Nash. This was 1996. Uh, he, they would, 96 to right through to 2000, the NWO would be formed and would really take over the professional wrestling world, would usher in or force Vince to do what he called the Attitude Era over in WWF, uh, WCW. This, as much as they pulled back that curtain on the kayfabe with Madison Square Garden, Hall and Nash coming into WCW at the time, especially again with the lack of too much of the internet involvement, kind of there he came across kayfabe in 1996, them coming into the opposing company show all of a sudden saying that they're taking over, they're there to run things. They call themselves the outsiders. We really for a bit kind of believed that these guys were still Vince's boys coming over to the other show and stuff like that. And they would have you believe this at least for I'd say the first few months or first couple of months of appearances and stuff like that until everything started to unfold and the NWO would grow by 25 wrestlers a week and stuff like that, get a little out of control. But again, Skull Hall, uh, for better or worse, depends on how you feel about the NWO and the Attitude Era and the way things were back then, really kind of changed the game in that sense and doing what he did in going over there, whether he was the mastermind behind it or not, he really went with the flow and he was a great talent. He always was there doing his part. I believe that if he was trusted a little bit more, I think Scott Hall should have been the guy to carry the championship over guys like Hall or the LA or sorry, not Hall. They're talking about Hall. This guy's like Kevin Nash. Personally, I think Hall was the better package as a whole than what Kevin Nash was. The problem was, you know, again, getting into those problems with Scott Hall and him showing up to work sometimes the way he would was kind of what made them reluctant to, you know, go with a long haul Scott Hall world championship run. I, I truly believe anyway, I don't know, I wasn't there, but I think personally, in terms of his work ability, he was better than any of the other members that were directly a part of the NWO initially. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I've listened to a lot of fans uh, just in the last few days uh, since Hall's passing talk about why wouldn't they, why wouldn't have Vince have put the belt on him and he's the best wrestler of, from WWE that that never had a run with the title. And uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think those people realize what the context was at the time that that wasn't a guy to put the belt on because he had a, propensity for being a little bit unreliable he uh, had his his substance abuse problems were well known although Vince wasn't helping him or doing anything about that but he still wasn't going to put the belt on this guy and probably a good thing he didn't considering the way he left I mean if Hall had had the belt at that time he would have taken it to WCW and thrown it in the garbage or something undoubtedly so I mean that's the same reason that that Vince never put this belt on Jake Roberts or, uh, you know, a number of people back at that time, uh, you just, you couldn't really trust them to represent your company as a, as a proper champion. And I'm sure that unfortunately that was the thing with Hall as well. And that's the thing everybody believes nowadays, especially a lot of the modern fans I find truly believe that everybody deserves a belt. Everyone should be world champion. Yeah. Everybody needs to play hot potato with world championships and all this kind of thing. And I think the term of a champion gets lost in that narrative and stuff like that too. The champion used to be a very special thing. Yes. You can look back and say there was some misfires when it comes to who was made world champion at times and stuff like that. And companies learn their lessons, but at the same time, that used to mean a lot more than what it does today. I mean, when they can hot potato a belt onto a celebrity and nobody gives a shit anymore and they can, you know, slap it over to a guy 13 times over and make a big deal. Oh, he's a 13 time world champion. Well, that used to fucking mean something when somebody like Ric Flair would say it, you know, to a degree, it kind of means something when somebody like Cena says it, but it's getting to the point where everybody's going to be a former 14, 15, 16 time fucking world champion because every title is a world championship nowadays and everybody has one. Yeah, that's just it. It means so much different nowadays than it used to in the territory days, because we've talked about this before in, in the territory days, you know, let's, let's say the NWA, the main belt back then, they had that whole committee of, of 35 promoters or whatever it was to, that would meet 
and all vote on who would be the next champion because there wasn't going to be one guy picking the next champion. They, they would all pick him because you had to pick the next champion on the criteria of, number one, how versatile is he? Will he be able to work with all those 35 territories' top guys and have great matches? That was the main consideration. Number two, is he trustworthy? Will he uh, make all his dates? Will he uh, bring the belt and, and be in, in good condition to wrestle and all that stuff? And number three, can he, uh, can he manage to do these endless tours? That was the thing is that you'd be touring all the time from New York to Seattle, to LA, to Miami, to Charlotte, to St. Louis, to Texas, Minneapolis, everywhere in between. It's huge, man. It's a gigantic territory. That's why a guy like uh, Ric Flair was perfect for the NWA title is because he, he was good at the traveling. He did all of his other crazy stuff in the meantime as well, but he was very, very serious about it. He was so versatile. He could work with anybody and have a good match, baby face side or heel side, didn't matter. And, um, that's not what's needed of a champion anymore. You do more TV tapings than you do live shows now. And they just don't tour like they used to. Uh, like WWE does some tours. I mean, we've seen them come through Canada a little bit over the last 10 years, but not very much like they used to. It's all about TV now. So you don't need a guy that, that can handle long tours like that. It's just he'll be going to their TV. It's more like having a job. You can stay at your home and get up and go to work every day without traveling all that much. And um, yeah, it, it's a completely different game. So, so they can put the belt on more different people and they can have uh, transitional champions like we saw Big E recently and, and that kind of thing. And uh, it's just, it's a very, very different job now. You go into programs with one guy for weeks or months now too, instead of wrestling different dudes every single night in different cities. It's a completely different uh, uh, definition of being a world champion nowadays than it used to be. Yeah, of course, the narrative always changes and stuff like that, and we have to make adjustments. But again, I think, again, that narrative gets a little bit lost, and some of it can still live on. I mean, we look at the way they're handling Roman Reigns' current run uh, just about two years as a world champion and making him now one of the top five or six longest WWE champions in history. I mean, again, and it's making an impact. People are loving it, and it just goes to show that I think that some of those true values that come from the days of – the territories and stuff like that can still work in today's market and stuff like that if they just have the patience for it. And again, that's proven. But getting a little off the rails here, talking about Scott Hall and, uh, you know, his WCW time, uh, you know, that pretty much sums it all up there. The NWO was a massive hit. He made millions upon millions of dollars over there in WCW. But then again, who didn't make millions of dollars in 1990 to 2000 era? Uh, WCW. Uh, but from there, uh, just after the run with the WCW, he did have a short one year run with ECW, very short lived, but he was there for a very brief period of time. Uh, he came back in 2002 for a short run with the WWE, returning as the NWO, a very, very short stint as the NWO in the WWE, as the fans in Toronto would prove that apparently you can change Vince's narrative on uh, one night of chanting for the op op opponent you're not supposed to, in terms of turning Hulk Hogan into a complete baby face over your star of the rock in one single night. Thank you, people in Toronto. Uh, from there, I want to talk to you a little bit about this, because I know you probably would have watched uh, a lot of this era as well too uh from 02 to 05 07 to 08 and then again in 2010 scott hall actually was a active participant of tna wrestling as well too yeah yeah and i've seen a little bit of this but um by this time the his in ring and everything seemed to be kind of dropping off a little bit and you could see that the problems were starting with him he he didn't look the same he didn't have that spring in his step. He didn't have the uh, the presence of the uh, of the ring work that he'd had in the past. And I think this is where uh, 
his body was starting to get sore. He was taking a lot of pills. He was drinking a lot and whatever other various substances uh, of a recreational nature were going on at this time. I'm sure there were a, a lot. I've heard some of uh, Waltman's stories about what the guys were getting up to after the shows. And it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't screwing around with getting wasted after the shows. And uh, I felt the same sadness as, as anybody else to start to see him looking older, looking he wasn't even really that old at that time, but he started looking older. His face was getting full, like a person that drinks too much. It's kind of getting that uh, water swollen look. And then as we saw, it got worse and worse. And then some of he was eventually making those uh, independent uh, appearances and stuff and just really like looking so, so terrible, unable to really perform for a lot of those. And, I know everybody felt the sadness. There's that one show where he comes out, he just gotten out of the hospital for a drug overdose that afternoon, showed up at the show with his hospital bracelet still on and obviously really not knowing where he was and but kind of trying to come out and still work the fans a little bit and the fans not having it and the promoter not having it. And God, it just became a bloody mess. And this is when I think a lot of us started to really get worried about uh, Scott Hall and Razor Ramon by the time of, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, he was not looking good. And, uh, and, and we all wanted him to turn the corner or else it, it was going to be over sooner than, than we thought. And uh, as we know, uh, later on with, with the help of uh, Diamond Dallas Page, he was one of those guys that did manage to uh, turn his health around and, and get a little bit of his uh, career back. Yeah, he not only turned his life around, but as a result of uh, both him and Jake the Snake at the same time doing the DDP yoga and, of course, Diamond Dallas bringing them in and actually watching over them, making sure they get clean, not only committing to the yoga to get their uh, shape back and stuff like that, but he committed them to eating healthy, committed them to staying off the substances and stuff like that. I mean, again, I, I had nothing but mad respect when I saw what DDP was doing for these guys. Um, I had mad respect for him in general as a, it seemed like he's just an overall good dude. But when I saw this in the resurrection of the Jake, the snake documentary, I mean, it was sad to see both Jake and Scott at this point in their life. Uh, the two guys that, you know, I grew up watching as a kid and just absolutely adoring their work. And here they are just a, a shell of them for themselves, like guys who used to intimidate me, who I sat there and looked at and like, like you're fragile and DDP, took them in and only got them back on track. But, you know, he made them stronger people once again. Again, like Jake nowadays looks better than he ever has since, you know, probably the early 90s. Uh, Scott was was looking better. I, he really did make a big difference. At one point, he looked like he was confined to a wheelchair and he got out of that. He got to get inducted along with Jake the Snake to the WWF Hall of Fame. And then again, just last year, even though it was the 2020 class, they did it in 2021 so they could do it in front of fans. The NWO was inducted into the WWF Hall of Fame. So Scott Hall becoming a two-time WWF Hall of Famer. And so, yeah, that that was the career of Scott Hall up until the point. What a career he had, man. I, I, I just looking at the time that we've been sitting here chit-chatting about Scott Hall, and I realized like this is turning into one of our most in-depth episodes, but probably one of my overall favorite, just reliving the memories of Scott Hall and everything he did inside that ring and changing the game in so many ways. I think, that, again, I mentioned it earlier, he made me believe that it was okay to root for the bad guy. Yeah. And, and like you said at the beginning, I mean, this is partly a sad conversation, but partly happy too, because we haven't been talking about Scott Hall lately. And I, I mean, it's awful that he's passed now, but uh, it's also a natural part of life that people are going to pass. So let's take this opportunity to, uh, to talk about the great moments in his career. And, and we've talked about some of the moments that he popped us as young fans and, uh, and the admiration we had for him and uh, and we can put him over you know one last time as as he'll be remembered as one of the uh, one of the big wrestling stars of our time for sure and like scott hall said it best in his wwf hall of fame induction he said bad times don't last but bad guys do 
So Scott Hall, yeah. for everything you ever did for me as a fan of professional wrestling, what you did for this world, what you did for Pop Smokes, thank you, sir. We hope that uh, you forever, you know, are mem- are remembered forever by everybody who ever graces this planet that has become a wrestling fan. You made a huge impact. Thank you for everything. And hopefully, in any way, shape, or form, anyone listening believes that we did some sort of justice to the career of one of the most uh, fantastic, phenomenal individuals to step in the squared circle. Anything else, Papa Smokes, that you want to add to the conversation before we uh, shut this one down tonight? No, I don't think so. Uh, A good talk, though, and uh, always sad that we have to do these obituaries to an extent, but I'm seeing the happy side, too, and that uh, it's an opportunity to talk about people that help to form the business that we love. It sure is. So, everyone, thank you for Tuning in for the long haul, this has been one hell of an edition of Ring Respect Radio. We want to thank you for listening along. Thank you for taking the time to support us here at Ring Respect Radio on the Video Bros Network. We hope that you'll also join Papa Smokes and I once we head on over to Love Wrestling for major Love Wrestling MLW reviews. Tune in very soon as that's going to be coming up shortly on Love Wrestling. But in the meantime, go support everybody who does this kind of work in professional wrestling. Support your local independent wrestling shows. You never know who's going to show up on those things and who they might become. Support Backbreaker Media, Backbreaker Podcast. I can't point where shit never can. Also, uh, do us a favor, throw a like, throw a subscribe, and just generally be a good person out there and enjoy some professional wrestling for myself and Papa Smokes. Until the next time we see you, take care and enjoy wrestling. <laughs>